guys and your family in, are enduring at this time? As are other families Amen. around, people are enduring some crazy, difficult things. But let me tell you, you walk in those doors and you say to God, I love you. Amen. And I know you're with me. Amen. I want to be in your house. It gives me a, uh, is there such thing as Holy Ghost goosebumps? Because yeah. that's kind of what it does. Because there's nothing like, you know, you can go through some really long and difficult hardships. But, you know, the enemy, he's got another thing coming. If he's going to take from us, he thinks he's going to take from us our love and passion for our King. Our love for our God because he loves us and loves us so much. That's what it does. It just revives that ability to, to believe. God is so good. So good. Amen. Thank you for putting a smile on my face. To your, to your whole family. Because it brings you joy. It's just a joy. We did, uh, right before you guys, we were lifting up my brother just. We did hear the, the recent report. And we were lifting him up. Let's not, let's, not, let's not end our prayer until the day that we see Brother Jess, whether he's part of the way and he's got to roll it in a little or he's got came for assistance or he's walking in. Come on, like this. How many, how many have you ever seen Brother Jess do it? <laughs> <laughs> God, it is so hard sometimes, Lord, to keep our eyes on you. Lord God, we know the enemy is constantly at work trying to get our eyes on everything but you. God, we admit and confess that it's hard sometimes. So God, we come to you today just declaring that you are God, you are good, asking that you would give us all that we need because we don't want our eyes on anything else in front of you. Lord, we want you, we want you, we want you in every aspect of this life that you give to us. We don't want you missing from any part of it. And God, we know that you're faithful. Help us today, Lord. Feed us today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Turn with me, if you will, to the book of Joshua, chapter 9. The book of Joshua, chapter 9. Anybody got a, a, a room temperature water? My, my voice is already goofed up. It's already sounding good. So I haven't even started yet. Just a little bit of water. <sighs> so this morning, I want to minister. Oh, you may have my sister. Thank you. And, and why are you not understanding that? Hey, man. I sure it's hard. 
servants in the house of God. All right. I can't begin to tell you all that God is saying. This is what God saying to me. What I believe God wants to say through me. Uh, as far as in the church. I can't begin. There's not enough time. But I will say to you the things that God wants us to say. This conference was about going back to the altar. What well, going back, exactly why? Back to the altars that have been broken. Going back to them to repair them. Get them back to where they need to be. What are those altars? Those altars are a place in our life, and it's not necessarily just here, although this is definitely a corporate altar. But an altar can be in your home, in your car, anywhere you are, everywhere you are, wherever God is speaking to you, wherever you go back and respond to God uh, in, in many different ways, that can be an altar. But when in our life in Christ, our walk with God begins to take a turn where our altars, where we spend time seeking God, asking God to lead us and show us rather than just asking God to take care of stuff while we do what we think is right. When those altars that we were used to just spending time with God, crying out to Him, seeking Him for direction, and then being busy in the kingdom while you're waiting for answers and go and so forth. When those altars are broken, let me tell you what else is broken, or uh, it's actually the same thing, is a broken relationship. He is King. He is God. He's the one that saved us. He's the one that rescued us from our darkness, brought us into his marvelous light. He's the one that laid for us a beautiful plan that's perfectly fitting. And no other plan in our life will fulfill <coughs> other than the plan of God. And so when the altars are broken, we start to do all the wrong things in many different ways. And then the fruit of, that, of those kinds of things came. That was a very, very quick overview of something that needs to be explained way more in the near future, the altars of God. Going back to the altar to repair the altars that have been broken. You might think, well, I'm good, I pray, I read my Bible, so this is a good message for someone else. Hear the whole message, maybe you might think this. Because even if you pray, even if you read, even if you come to church, that does not necessarily mean that God is leading you. It can all be the opposite. Because we're very capable of that. We're very capable of telling God what He should do in our life. We're very capable of telling God how He ought to bless us. We're even capable of doing things with the intention of, I did this, God, so now it's your turn to do something back for me. And none of that is a real altar. Because at the altar, some of the, the most important things that happen at an altar, because of our relationship with God, one, one thing that was talked about in the conference is true repentance. True repentance. Does anybody know what true repentance is? True repentance is when we feel conviction. The Holy Spirit convicts us in our hearts over things that we just kind of, you know, we, we've done some things, thought some things, or whatever it is. The Holy Spirit convicts us. We, we, we feel that conviction. We're sorry for our sin. We're sorry for what we've done. We go to God and we repent. We ask God to forgive us. We change. We say, God, I'm sorry. I don't want this in my life. I don't want this to, to, to be... My, the way I live, I want to live for you. And so true repentance happens 
at the altar. That is not an ongoing thing. Let me ask you a quick question. How many of you would say, I repent more than once a day in my life? Well, that's a great, great place to be and a great place to start. When you're constantly in repentance in your life, it's not that you're always walking around with a guilt trip. That's not what we're doing. That's not what we're doing. We're not trying. We're not like sin, feel guilty. I'll just repent so that I'll feel better, but I know I'm going to sin again. That's not true repentance. True repentance is I, I, I'm, I'm fighting against this thing. I'm turning away from that. I'm not doing that anymore. And if I should stumble, I am going to let the conviction of the Holy Spirit get deep in my heart, and I'm going right back to righteous living. And I'm not going to be uh, making the excuse. I'm going to truly repent. Another thing, and by the way, that's a great place to be because when your heart's tender before God, you can feel His displeasure for sin. Yeah. And when you feel the displeasure of the sin in our life, don't think of that as a bad thing. Think of that as a really good thing. You know why? Because our Heavenly Father is being a loving Father, caring over your life, wanting you to fulfill your, your fullest destiny and have all that He has have all that he has for you, but it will not happen if he's not leading us. And if, which brings me to the next thing. Things that happen at the altar, repentance, truly surrendering our lives to God, responding, uh, uh, responding to God. You know, everything, and Pastor Larry said this at the conference, everything we do, God is looking for a response. From us. When we preach the, the scriptures, when we read the word, when we pray, when God commands us, when he teaches us and tells us what he wants us to do, and when he wants us to stop doing, and when he wants us to seek uh, him over, whatever it is God is asking us, even when worship's happening, we're being invited to go into the presence of God and love him, even when giving's happening, we're being invited to give and worship that way. When, when ministry's happening, we're invited to serve God. All of that, God is looking for a response. For us to respond to God. To respond to God. To respond to His Word. That happens at an altar. Have you ever been convicted? Message being preached, you feel convicted in your heart, not just for sin, but sometimes maybe just for neglect or distraction, and you just want to get right back with God and get right back to what you're supposed to be doing, what you know He's commanded you to do. Have you ever been at an altar for that? That's an altar. That's a response. God, I'm sorry. I got off track. I'm getting right back on track because I want to obey you. I want to do what you've called me to do. That is something else that happens at the altar. That's God. Required response. What else? Renewal. How do you know that as human beings we fail sometimes? All right, Father, in Jesus' name. Yes, that's all the message we can handle, right? Uh, we fail at times. We get distracted. We get callous. We even get hard-hearted because of sin. And so the altar is there for ongoing renewal. You and I were saved. The Lord has saved us, rescued us from our sin, broke every chain. But that doesn't mean believers don't sin. That doesn't mean believers don't get a rebellious attitude or a rebellious heart. That doesn't mean that, that, um, that believers don't allow the little foxes in to destroy the vine. And little by little you start uh, what you used to be all faithful and passionate. And now you're all goofed up. You don't know how you got there? It happens to believers. Actually, it only happens to believers because unbelievers aren't even serving God yet. For, for believers, if we're not careful, we can get really derailed. And so what happens is we need to renew at the altars, renew those commitments, renew that faithfulness, renew the response, renew the, 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 the sorrow that leads to repentance. You know, sometimes... You know, we need to be sorry. Sometimes we need to be sorry for the wrong in our life. Amen? Amen. Amen. There's a difference between condemnation and conviction. We need to be convicted. Convicted is a good thing. It draws us to God. Don't be condemned. Just be convicted. <coughs> Amen. So, a lot.
lot of things about the altar were shared um, at the conference. A lot of things. And for me, the natural progression, I, I, I'm pretty sure a lot of us didn't get to see, get to be a part of every service at the altar, uh, at the conference. But maybe you got one or two or all of them or what. But we are, we are making them available, so get it. Listen to these messages and listen to what we're over on the altars. Powerful stuff. But what I, I, I went to the Lord. I said, I start today, Lord. I'm not going to waste any time with five minutes ago of my failures. I'm not going to waste any time with trying to fix a distraction that I've had. I'm not wasting that time. I'm going right to the altar and asking God to forgive me and asking God to help me to get right back to where I need to be. Because a lot is counting on me. A lot. Joshua chapter 9. I'm going to read to you a story that will reveal to us what happens when we don't go to the altars of God. When we don't seek. Do you remember Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, I think it was verse 33 and 34, uh, your heavenly Father knows you have need of everything that you need. But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added. Seek first. What goes first? The seeking of the Lord and the waiting upon the Lord. He'll add. He'll add to your life, right? Well, we are going to look at a story that will demonstrate to us what happens when we leave our altars broken, when we don't go to God for direction, when we don't ask God to lead our life, when we lead it with our abilities and what we think is good. When that happens and we don't go to the altars. Are you ready for this? Because I'm going to move quickly. Because I can't preach a message like this and then not have altar time. And even if I'm the only one at the altar, you guys are just going to have to sit there and watch me pray. Or you can be up here with me. Yeah. All I know is I want God in a very, very deep way. And I'm so thankful that he's done that to my heart once again. Listen to the story. Joshua chapter 9. Verse 1. And it came to pass. When all the kings who were on the side of the Jordan, in the hills, and in the lowland, and on all the coasts of the great sea toward Lebanon, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, when they all heard about it, that they gathered together to fight against Joshua and against the children of Israel, the one accord. All these armies came together far off to become one army to fight against the children of Israel. Are you listening? Yeah. Verse 3. But when the inhabitants of Gideon heard what Joshua had done to Jericho and Ai, what <coughs> happened there? The people of Gideon were look, look, looking around listening, seeing these armies coming together to fight against the children of Israel. But these guys said, hold on. God fought for Israel. And they defeated Jericho without raising the sword. God fought for them, even though they made mistakes in the AI. God fought for them and took care of the children of Israel and defeated AI. God did. So the Bible says here, verse 3, when the inhabitants of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done to Jericho and Ai, they worked craftily. I want to make sure everybody's really listening to this story. Okay, just let's make sure. Don't let the enemy steal from you this morning. When they heard this, verse 4, they worked craftily and went and pretended to be ambassadors. And they took, an old, they took old sacks on their donkeys, old white skins, torn and mended, verse 5, old patched sandals on their feet, old garments on themselves, and all the bread of their provision was dry and moldy. 
And they went to Joshua, to the camp of at Gilgal, and said to him, to the men of Israel, We have come from a far country. Now therefore, make a covenant with us. Then the men of Israel said to the Hivites, Perhaps you will perhaps you dwell among us. So how can we make a covenant with you? What he's saying is, wait a minute. How do we know you're not just, you don't live close by? How do we know that? That's what that means. Dwelling <coughs> among us. How do we know you're not our neighbor? So you're asking us to make a covenant during this war time. Right. Still listening? Yes. Amen. So he goes on to say, Verse 7, Then the men of Israel said to the Hivites, per Perhaps you dwell among us, so how can we make a covenant with you? But they said to Joshua, We are your servants. And Joshua said to them, Who are you, and where do you come from? So they said to him, From a very far country, your servants have come, because of the name of the Lord your God. For we have heard of his fame, and all that he did in Egypt. And all that he did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sion, king of Heshbon, and Og, king of Bashan, who was at Ashtaroth. Verse 11. Therefore, our elders and all the inhabitants of all the inhabitants of our country spoke to us, saying, Take provisions with you for the journey, and go to meet Joshua. Go to meet them and say to them, We are your servants. Now therefore make a covenant. Stop here for a minute. This is what they're saying. We've heard about how God has fought for you and destroyed the enemies of the Lord. We realize that you're the children of God. We don't want to be destroyed. So we're coming to you. We're, we're, we want to be your servants. We're from a far country so that you'll make a covenant. How many know a covenant is a promise? Yes. Oh. Yeah. You know, the Old Testament and the New Testament? Another word for it is Old Covenant, New Covenant. It's God's yeah. promises to us. Yeah. And we make promises to God. And we make promises in God. And so they're saying, so we're from far. We're tired. Look at the effort we made. We fear you. Be, uh, make a covenant with us. You still following? Yeah. Verse 11 again. Therefore our elders take provisions, go meet them, make a covenant. Verse 12. This bread of ours we took hot from, from our provision, like right out of the oven before we left. That's what he's saying. Right out of the oven, we got our, our bread. Now look at it. So look what he says. Uh, we departed to come to you, but now look, it's dry and moldy. Verse 13. And these white skins which were filled with dew. And see, they are torn. And these are garments, our sandals, that become old because of, of our very long journey. Verse 14. Then the men of Israel took of their provisions, but they did not ask counsel of the Lord. Key verse. They did not ask counsel of the Lord. So verse 15. So Joshua made peace with them, made a covenant with them, let them live. And the rulers of the congregation swore to them. And it happened at the end of three days, after they had made covenant with them, that they heard that they were the neighbors right down the street. I just paraphrased. And the children of Israel journeyed and came to their cities on the third day. It didn't take them long to get to their city, did it? Verse 18, but the children of Israel did not attack them. Because the rulers of the congregation have swore to them by the Lord of Israel, and all the congregation complained against the rulers. And all the rulers said to all the congregation, We have swore to them by the Lord, God of Israel, now therefore we may not touch them. Let's stop right here. We're going to tie this together. We're going to learn from this. The story itself, it's some sort of self-explanatory. But let me help you see what we might be missing. How many know that God does have an enemy? Yes. The enemy is Satan and demons. The worldly ways and the flesh. Did you know that the, one of the greatest enemies, if not the greatest enemy to our God, is our flesh? Yes. 
So there is an enemy that God wants to kill. And in this Old Testament, we don't have the time to explain when God sends his army to destroy land. We don't have the time right now. Just understand that it's a very powerful, powerful message from God when God says, that evil, I've given it chance after chance. I've given it mercy after mercy. I've given it grace after grace. Now it is time to kill it before it takes over. And so, the people of Gibeon were a part of that. They were a part of the people who would come against God and his people standing against the works of the Lord and standing so forth and so on. Just, just part of all that evil. But they got an idea. They knew they were next because they were the closest ones. And so they got the idea. Let's look like we come. Let's trick them. Let's deceive them. Let's look like we're all messed up, beat up, and we've been on this long journey. And let's get them to make a covenant, a promise that if we commit to be your servants, you won't attack us and kill us. Here, let me help you with that. Let's make a covenant. So that you won't do what God wants you to do yes. against them. God wants us to put the flesh in subjection yes. for the purpose of the kingdom. God wants us to say no to temptation. God wants us to make wise decisions from the direction of God yes. for our life. Yes. God wants us to stand against the enemy, not buddy around with the enemy. God wants us to get rid of the little foxes in our life that are constantly destroying our fruit. God wants us to stand in righteousness and not be afraid to stand out, even when the whole world says that you're crazy for living, you know, you're, you're weird living for God and being all uh, over, you're, you're too saved. God wants us to put to death the things that need to be put to death. And so when these people came to Joshua, this is what they were saying. Look at us. You know, we proved that we're your servants. Now, make a promise that you won't do anything to us. You know what that's like? That's like the enemy of your soul. Think of any problem in your life, any temptation, any sin, any things that you know are wrong, anything that you know will hinder you and mess you up. Mess up your life, mess up your calling, mess up your heart, mess you up. Imagine that in a person coming to you and saying, promise me you won't get rid of me. And I won't, and I'll be good. <laughs> promise me you won't get rid of me. I'm pornography. Promise me I'll be good. I won't bother you if you just don't kill me. Gambling comes up. Ah. I promise I won't eat away that much of your money if you will just promise me you won't get rid of me. <clears throat> it's like if you put, you think of it, whatever your hindrance is, whatever it is, it comes to you and say, promise me that you won't obey God and you'll protect me. Let me live. Let me live. Pastor Ray said something in the pastor's meeting that blew my mind on Tuesday night. He said, have you ever heard of the elephant in the room? Yes. Have you ever? Yes. And he, he gave a different perspective. He said, the elephant in the room is usually when there's a subject that nobody wants to touch, and so when nobody wants to bring it up. That's the elephant in the room, right? Yes. He brought a different perspective. He said, the elephant in the room in this case is this. You get this baby elephant, and he's parked in your living room. <laughs> and you just, as you pass by, you feed it. Head it, take care of it. Don't do anything to it, but that elephant grows. Before you know it, he grows so big, he can't get out the door. Now he's taking up all your room, and you have learned to just let it live and adjust to it to where when you want to go somewhere, you got to go like this and, and get around it. And you got to, you know, uh, and you, you put your bed in a small corner because there's no room to be comfortable anymore because that elephant in the room has grown and now you can't get rid of it. Even if you wanted to get rid of it, it's too big now. You can't get rid of it. This is that same thing that those ugly things that stop us from doing God's work coming to us saying, please let me live. 
And I won't, I won't bother you. Yeah, it's like that outfit. You just leave it alone. And watch and see what happens to it. God's telling us, get rid of that. Stop that. Get back on focus. The kingdom of God is at hand. Preach this gospel. Live for me, not for yourself. There is a work to be done. Time is short. And God's people, so distracted, so into themselves, can't find their way around the elephant because the elephant's taking up all the room. Well, preacher. Are you listening? Yes. yes. This is what it is. This is group. Here's the saddest part of it all. The saddest part of it all. We're going to have an altar time today, okay, guys? Even if it's a little weak. You okay with that? We can. Yeah. Right? I know, oh, I got things I got to game to watch. Right? You know what? Then go now. Then go now. Amen. Don't miss your game. Rest you. <laughs> Notice I didn't laugh. <laughs> Even though it's kind of funny. You got, to, you got that? You, you know, there's some things we can't get around, but if it's something like that, don't stay here for pretenses. Don't stay here because it, so you can look like you're being faithful. It's either from here or from it's not. And God knows the difference. Here are these people. They old some shoes and clothes. And then here's what happens. Verse 14, the men of Israel took from them, but they did not ask counsel of God. And then when they found out who it was, what they were supposed to do was go and kill them. But now they can't. Because they made a commitment. They made a promise before the Lord. Imagine Joshua going to God saying, God, what happened? What do we do? I can imagine God saying, what do you mean? What do you do? You didn't ask me for advice. You didn't get my counsel. You did that. And now, now you're gonna, when everybody else is, you know, um, in this battle, you're going to be protecting them. You're going to be feeding them now, taking care of them, giving them shelter. You're going to make sure they're comfortable because you didn't seek me to find out what my will was for your life. Is anybody listening? Amen. Are you still paying attention or is that all you can handle? Here, brother, brother. Lift your hand if you, if you can handle a little more. Amen. Okay. I want to touch on this and bring this down because there's just not enough time to say everything, but we, it needs to be said. What happens? What could happen when we don't go to the altars of God? When we don't seek God? What could happen? Let me tell you. When you don't see God, when your altars are broken, when you're not seeking God for His will for your life, you know you grow weak. Because that's your strength. That's your strength. And when you don't have strength, and here comes the distraction, here comes the temptation, here comes this weird thing saying, compromise. You won't have the strength, the focus, the passion for God yes. to look at it with the right heart and say, wait a minute. You're asking me to compromise. You're asking me to do something that I know is wrong. Your mind can get so cloudy when you're not seeking God at those personal altars of your life. And so what will happen is you might even go, why was I not doing that again? Why did I, I used to say no to that? I kind of don't remember. I just remember I used to say, no, but it doesn't seem like that big a deal right now. It doesn't seem that wrong anymore. So you know what? Yeah. Okay. Faithfulness? What is this faithfulness? Why? Did, why? Now, what was the big old thing? We used to be all crazy faithful for God in every way. What was the big thing? I don't get it. Yeah, it doesn't seem like that big a deal anymore. You know what? You see what happens is we have no strength to see clear, to respond right, to, to be ready for a battle that comes, or ready to go get a victory. What else can happen? Let me tell you what can happen. Looking at this, 
Which floor, what floors me about this story is they did something that a lot of us do. You ready for this? They looked at these people and to their logical mind looked at everything and said, that makes sense. They look tired, holding breath, messed up clothes, they're all dirty. Makes sense. Looks right. Most of the time, God's people are hindered from doing all that God's called them to do. Not from some deep, dark, ugly thing in the world. Sometimes it's just saying, hey, God, I don't want what's best for me. I'll take the second break. I'll do the good thing, but I won't do the obedient thing. I won't, I won't do that sin anymore, but God, I, but I, I just still want to do my own thing. In other words, sometimes the biggest enemy to best is good. Because good is not best. And God wants his best for you and I. But sometimes through, through something like this, we do this, we do this kind of thing where, uh, where there's things in our life and we just make decisions based on how it looks. Well, that looks like the right thing to do. That looks like the right thing to do. And it makes sense. And I can't see anything wrong with it. Well, guess what, folks? If you're not careful, you can make a decision based on what you think looks right, not seek God, and you can end up with some long-term, hard-to-change problem. Well, you know, we can repent, get right, serve God, and keep going. But there are some things, folks, that uh, the result of us not seeking God, but just doing it because it seems right, and it just seems like the right thing to do, you know, it can turn into a long-term problem. Look at their problem. Their problem lasted for, the Bible says, uh, uh, and to this day, those people are still protected. There are some problems in our life, probably, you know, some things that we do. We get in debt, for example, big amounts of debt, and man, it takes forever and ever to get out of debt. And the reason is, is and, and because of that now, we're not serving God, living for God, we're living for our debt. We can't give to God because we've got to give to God to pay the debt back. We can't do, uh, we can't give uh, generously for the kingdom's work because we're too me messed up in the debt. Long-term problems that are so hard to fix. Wouldn't it be easier to have a life at the altars, seeking God, God, I want to live for you, I want to live for the way you want me to live. And then when, you, when something comes, you're ready for it, and you're not just so quick to say, hey, that makes sense. I'll just do that. Instead, no. What does God think about it? What does God want me to do? Man, it's too quiet in here. That means I'm going to preach some more of it. No, actually, the truth is, I don't need any, I don't need any feedback, but I just... I just want to make sure that somebody's getting it. Because if you're getting it, then you will, you will make the change. You will do the right thing. You will live for God. And so, what we'll, what we'll do to this morning is I'll just touch one more thing. And then we're going to pray. You know, there are sometimes when, when we don't see God, when we don't have those altars in our life, when we're not relying on God's power for our life, things can come our way, distractions and so forth. We're not strong. We don't have the strength to combat. But there are some things that when you make a decision, it's not that you can't turn it around. It's not that God can't give you the strength to turn it around. But sometimes it's just so good to the flesh. Kind of, it's really hard to turn it around. I knew a guy once. He was a young pastor. Making good money, but just in his mind, not enough. He was quite a vocational pastor. He was working a job and pastor church. One day he just said, you know, I'm, I'm tired of not having the, what I really want. He went and got a second job. Second job at pastoring the church, and little by little, 
something had to give. He ended up giving up the ministry because it just became too good to have a nice bank account. It became too good to just be able to eat out all the time and have big fancy meals, fancy cars, house, debt. It just, it became too hard to give that. <clears throat> oh God, you don't understand. It's hard to let go of this paycheck now, God. I, I know it's right, but now I'm so used to it now that it's just too hard to turn it around. Folks, I just, I believe I'm speaking by the presence of God, by the there is nothing better for us than the, the will of God, the call of God for our life. It's perfect in it. It's perfect in every way for us, no matter if it's easy, hard, or all of the stuff in between. It is the perfect thing that God has for us. And the enemy will do anything he can to stop you from experiencing it. And I'm going to tell you this. There is nothing more important than what I'm going to tell you. Don't go out. Maybe I mentioned something that reminded you of something that you could repent and fix. Don't go out and try to fix anything. Fix the altar first. Fix the altar first. We need to surrender our hearts to God. Ask God for, to forgive us for a going astray, even if it's not like outright sin, the Bible tells us that he who knows to do right and doesn't do it, to him that sin, yeah. even if you're not out there doing something in the, you know, in the red light district somewhere, I don't know, folks, you know that you're right and don't do it, to, to us that sin, the Bible tells us, so before we go, oh, I'm going to go fix that, I'm going to cut my credit cards up and stop spending that so don't increase my debt. Oh, I'm going to go fix that and I'll, maybe I'll come to one more church service a month or whatever. Whatever things that you, you might think we could fix, don't go fix that. You know, fix the altar first. I, and by the way, if I've got a face, this face is for me too. I'm so hungry for this. I want this so bad. I want to fix my altar. I want my altar to be vibrant and alive. I want my altar to be where I'm before God, crying out, seeking God, wanting Him. And I don't care if it takes forever for Him to tell me what He wants. It don't matter. I'm yours, Lord. And I, you know that childlike faith that says it don't matter. I'm going to do. If God asks me to do something hard, He asked. He asked. I'm going to do it with my heart. I'm not going to, uh, you know, go ask permission for my bank account. I'm not going to go ask permission from someone else to see if I can obey God. My altars are strong and alive. I'm seeking Him, asking for Him to show me. Therefore, I'm ready Amen. when it comes for whatever He has. Let's not fix all the little things. Let's fix the altar first. 